Hi everyone, my name's Diabetor, and today I'm going to show you how to beat Ranala easily and without cheese or summons. My preferred method of beating her is with dual straight swords, so we're going to start off by heading over to the Nomadic Merchant on the coast to the west of the Church of Ella. He sells a broadsword, and he also sells a couple other useful items that I'll talk about in a second, but he sells the broadsword, and if you don't have a second straight sword, you can buy the long sword from the Twin Maiden Husks in the Round Table Hold. So here you see, we're getting the broadsword. He also sells the club, which is pretty good. He sells a bow. He sells some smithing stones, which are good if you need to upgrade your stuff. And if you're an archer, he sells infinite arrows and infinite bolts. Up next, we're going to head over to the Weeping Peninsula to grab the Morning Star. So when you come to the Bridge of Sacrifice, if you run on the side here, the ballista will shoot the pillar or the tower, whatever you want to call it and then you can run past while it's still reloading. So if you're having trouble getting past that, that's the strategy to do it. So anyway, we grab the Site of Grace here at the Bridge of Sacrifice. You can get here just by following the main road through Limgray from the gate front. Just follow it to the east and then head south. Alternatively, the way I got here was from the first step. You can just run across the lake shore like this, and then once you get to the road, just follow it south, and you'll be at the bridge. So there's a lot of useful stuff in the Weeping Peninsula. The main thing we're coming here for is the Morning Star, which is going to be really useful for dealing with Ranala's Phase 1. Um, there's also a few Sacred Tears for your flasks. There's a Golden Seed. There's a whole bunch of Smithing Stones. Um, there's a whole bunch of useful stuff here, so I recommend you explore this if you haven't explored the Weeping Peninsula yet. But as you see, we follow the road, and at the Destroyed Carriage, we grab the Morning Star out of the back of it. And then if we follow the road a bit further south, there's a Merchant here. He sells a bunch of smithing stones, including a smithing stone too. Um, he also sells infinite cookeries, which are really nice to have. They do bleed build up. Up next, we're going to head up to the Stormhill Shack in Limgrave to grab the Wild Strikes Ash of War. So from the gate front, you follow the road up to the Stormhill Shack. We're also going to be heading over to the Warmaster Shack in a second. So here we are now at the Stormhill Shack. From here, we're going to follow the road to the north and hook a left. That'll take us towards the main entrance to Stormvale. On the road right here, you'll find an Ash of War Scarab, and when you kill it, it drops the Wild Strikes Ash of War. This is going to go really well with our Morning Star. After that, you can head east from the Stormhill Shack, and that'll bring you to the Warmaster Shack, where we're going to talk to Warmaster Bernal. He has a quick dialogue. When you talk to him, he'll sell you a bunch of Ashes of War. All of these are really good, and you should definitely pick them all up uh, if you have the runes for it. Uh, so I bought Stamp, Spinning Slash, Impaling Thrust and Stormblade. The only ones I actually ended up using in this guide were Impaling Thrust and Stormblade, but Spinning Slash and Stamp Upward Cut are also both really good against Renala if you want to try out a different method for killing her. After that, we're going to head north from the Warmaster Shack and come up to this cliff over here, where we'll grab the Golden Vow Ash of War and the Lance Great Spear. So over here, you'll find a knight riding around on a horse. He's pretty easy to kill, especially if you have something like Spinning Slash or Impaling Thrust, which you can pick up from Bernal. Uh, just Stance Break him off the horse. That makes him fall off, and then he can get a crit. I went for a Charge R2 here, but he kind of dodged away from it and started blocking. Um, if you have Impaling Thrust, you can hit him through his shield, because it does shield chip damage. So if you're having trouble with him, keep that in mind. But you see, when you kill him, he drops the Golden Vow Ash of War. You can put this on any weapon. I like to keep it on something like a dagger. Uh, when you cast it, it gives you like a 40 second buff that increases your damage done and reduces your damage taken. After that, you can jump off the cliff to this ruin here. And on this corpse in the corner, we're going to grab the Lance Great Spear, which is really good. It hits hard and it's long as hell, so it gets a ton of range. After that, we're going to follow the road to the east from the Warmaster Shack, and we're going to head over to Summon Water Village. So there's a bridge you can cross that's guarded by a pumpkin head. Next to the bridge is Alexander Warrior Jar, if you want to talk to him for his quest line. And then in that spot right there, there's a merchant that'll sell you a couple useful items, including a crafting recipe and a few smithing stones. So you probably want to check him out. But we're going to head over to Summon Water Village. There's a boss here, but you can just run past it. You don't have to fight it. You're going to need a stone sword key for this, but we're going to open up the cellar. Down in the cellar, there's a bunch of turtles you can kill if you need their neck meat. And then in the chest, we're going to grab the green turtle talisman to increase our stamina regen. So speaking of talismans, I'm only using two talismans for this because I figure by this point in the game, you haven't gotten your third and fourth talisman pouch. You've probably killed Margit and gotten the talisman pouch from him. 
so you'll probably have two talisman slots. Obviously, if you have more, then feel free to use more talismans, but I figured we would use the Spelldrake Talisman to increase our magic negation and thus reduce the amount of damage we take from Ranala. Uh, all of her attacks do magic damage, so that's why. Now, you can get the Spelldrake Talisman plus zero, so the base form of it, uh, from the Earthbore Cave over in Reaping Peninsula. You can get to it by following the road, and then right before the bridge, you can head down into the woods and follow it to the cave. However, um, you have to kill the giant bear for that, and it's kind of a bitch to do. And you can get the plus one talisman from Celia, Town of Sorcery, over in Caelid. Obviously, the plus one version is more effective than the plus zero version. You can't get the plus two version until much later on in the game, so that's where we're going with plus one. But it's also a lot easier to do. You can just run past all the enemies in Celia and grab the talisman. You don't have to kill anything. Uh, and there's a nice little shortcut here that you've probably already accidentally run into. So if we head over to the Dragon Burnt Ruins, near where we fight Ag Heel in Ag Heel Lake, there are two cellars here. One of them has the Twin Blade, which is a nice weapon if you want to have a cool fucking Twin Blade. You know, the Twin Blade is badass as shit. But the easier to find cellar, uh, there's a bunch of rats that you probably want to kill. I didn't kill them, and they're going to hit me here, uh, but I had enough health to survive it. You should probably kill the rats before you go into it. But the chest here is a transporter trap, and it will take you to Celia Crystal Tunnel. So the chest here just has some items in it. It's not a teleporter that'll take you back. And now you're trapped here, so you can't fast travel until you rest at a site of grace. And since you're inside a dungeon, you have to kill the boss first. But you see here, you have been trapped. You cannot travel to sites of grace until you rest at one. So that's what we're going to do. So this is a decently high level area, but as long as you're careful, you can just run back to the entrance real quick. So that's what we're going to do. So from this shack, if you head to the left and run down this hill here, run past these miners. They don't attack you till you attack them. You're going to want to dodge when the pests shoot at you, but you'll probably have enough damage resistance that it won't like insta kill you. And then here's your summoning pool if you want to summon someone to help you with this cave. And then right next to it is the site of grace and the exit. So now you can obviously activate the Sight of Grace. If you sit at it, you'll be able to fast travel once you leave the cave. And here we are in Ohio. So from the exit of the tunnel, we're going to head to our left. And this is Celia Town of Sorcery. There's that blue seal there. I'll show you that in a second. That's where we need to go. Make sure you grab the Sight of Grace outside of town because there's a good chance you'll die here. That putrid stray does Scarlet Rot build up, so be careful of it. And then there's invisible sorcerers in town, so be careful of them. And they hit really hard. But so there's those blue seals that we need to light fires in the town to break the seals. There's one in particular that we're looking for. So to the south of the Site of Grace, you'll find the painting, and then you can jump on top of the balcony above it. You can probably get off of Torrent and jump on this little railing here, and then remount Torrent and jump up to the roof. It'll probably be easier. But anyway, so get on top of the roof, and then there's that tower that I just looked at. That's where we're headed. So again, this is the tower at the southernmost end of town. Climb up the ladder, light the brazier. That'll break the seal that has the Spelldrake Talisman chest in it. And if you needed a Stone Sword Key for earlier to get the Green Turtle Talisman, there you go. Anyway, so we're going to head over to the front end of town. We're going to jump over the staircase that leads to the Site of Grace. And then there's this little nook over here. There's a bunch of sorcerers guarding it, so be careful. But in this little nook over here, now that this is open, we can open up the chest and grab the Spelldrake Talisman plus one. Now we're going to head back over to Limgrave to Fort Height to grab the recipe for Blood Grease. So again, you can get here just by following the main road through Limgrave. From the gate front, head east, then follow the road to the north. You can just cut through the mistwood. You don't have to follow the road all the way around. There's a site of grace over here, so if you die to the giant bears in the woods, it's not too bad. But head over to Fort Height. Alternatively, from the Bridge of Sacrifice, if you head up the bridge, you can follow the coast here, and that'll just take you directly to Fort Height. So from the Site of Grace, we're going to follow the road up into Fort Height. There's some monkeys here. Be careful of them. Just outside of Fort Height, there's that golden seed. So make sure you grab that if you don't already have it. Inside Fort Height, there's a bunch of enemies that are going to be throwing fire pots at you. So be careful. You probably want to kill them instead of just running past them here. But I just ran past them. Inside this little room on this corpse, there will be the crafting recipe for the blood grease. Blood Grease is nice because it adds 30 bleed buildup to any weapon you put it on. It requires Root Resin and Blood Roses to craft, so we're going to need farming spots for both of those. So from the War Master Shack, if you head just to the right over here, you'll see underneath these trees, there's three Root Resins, so you can grab them. 
and then they respawn when you rest at a site of grace for fast travel. So if you need to farm a whole bunch of root resin, you can just sit at the grace and then run back and grab more. I also just want to point out while we're here that around the shack, there's also a bunch of other stuff. Like there's a mushroom, there's some rower fruit. Uh, I think there's a thing of poop. Yeah. And there's a couple other things close by. So if you need crafting materials, that's a decent place to grab them. After that, we need blood roses so we can get them from the Rose Church. So the closest site of grace to this is the Fallen Ruins of the Lake, just south of the Academy Gate Town. Unfortunately, there's no site of grace at the Rose Church itself, so we're going to need the closest one to be able to farm a bunch of blood roses. So that's the Fallen Ruins of the Lake. You can find it on the map really easily. So just south of the Gate Town, there's these three things of ruins. The westmost one is the Fallen Ruins with the uh, site of grace on it. I think one of those other ruins has a death bird spawn at night, so uh, I think it drops like ancient death ranker spell. But anyway, so head to the west, that takes you to the Rose Church. Inside the church, there are eight blood roses that'll respawn when you rest at the site of grace, so it's a good place to grab blood roses. There's also a sanguine noble that'll come out of the blood like fucking Freddy Krueger or something, but uh, you can just run away from him. While we're in the area, we're also going to grab the blood flame blade spell. So you see this scarab is a health scarab. You want to run to this other one that lets off like a higher pitched sound. When you kill this one, uh, it drops the Blood Flame Blade spell. I didn't use it in this guide, but it's useful to have if you want an alternative to Blood Grease, uh, you know, if you have the Faith or Arcane. It does have pretty low requirements to cast, so uh, if you have like Godric's Great Rune active, uh, you'll probably be able to cast it, but it's not for every build. So that's why I didn't use it, but keep it in mind because it's really good. It's probably better than Blood Grease. So now we're going to go get some smithing stones and upgrade our weapons. It's really easy to get up to a plus 9 by the time you get to Lyurnia. You need smithing stone 3s to bring it up to plus 9. So these two uh, gazebos on the lake, um, I like to call these two the twin titties. The left titty has a teleporter that'll take you to the map for the west side of uh, Lyurnia. The right titty has uh, three smithing stone 3s. So from the main academy gate, or the south academy gate rather, uh, you can take that little shortcut to jump off the bridge. Just be careful of that bear that's there. And then we're just going to head to the east towards the Twin Titties. So this one is the West Titty. It's got that teleporter, like I said. And I just want to show real quick. So the first map marker is over here by the Lascar Ruins. That gives you the east side of Lyurnia. And then if you need the west side map, you can take this teleporter. And it brings you all the way up here over to the King's Realm Ruins. And it puts you right about there, which is where the map for the west side of the Urnia is. So if you don't have that, it's a good shortcut to go get it. So anyway, our goal is to get to the east titty, so we're just going to run across the lake. It takes us through these woods. There's a bunch of Miranda flowers, but, uh, you know, they're just poison. They're not too hard. So in the gazebo, there's three smithing stone threes. And then to the southeast of it, you'll see this chair has another three smithing stone threes on it. So it's guarded by a bunch of Miranda flowers. Here's where it is on the map. So there's your titty, and then I figure I'm going to show these two rocks. So this rock and that rock, halfway between them is the approximate spot where the group of flowers is. So, you know, they're glowing bright blue, which shouldn't be too hard to find. And then there's a couple chairs here, and one of them has the uh, smithing stones on it. Now we're going to head to the Ray of Lucario Crystal Tunnel to get a bunch more smithing stone threes. Real quick, I just want to show from the main academy gate. Um, I saw a Reddit post the other day. Someone said they didn't know about this. You can go beyond these blue teleporter seals and uh, explore these bridges. So like that one to the south has a, a merchant on it. And then this one to the north at the end of it, there is a golden seed, which I'm going to show you here in a second. But yeah, so you can go past these onto these bridges and there are some goodies to find. You see all the way at the end is that golden tree that has a golden seed so you can upgrade your flasks. So make sure you grab that. So anyway, we're going to take the easternmost seal, and that's going to bring us over to the Bellum Highway. So there's a set of grace right to our left over here. But you see, this is where we are on the map relative to the Academy. It just takes us across this bridge. So there's a set of grace here. You're going to want to grab it, especially since you're going to need to come back here at a later point, but that's not in this video. But anyway, so if you head to the south, you can come onto this cliff here, and you'll hear that uh, wandering mausoleum. Drop down to the lower part of the cliff. And here it is on the map, in case you need a little help finding it. And then if you look down, you'll see there's a spirit stream down there. So we're going to jump down into the spirit stream. So if you land in a spirit stream from any height, you don't take fall damage. 
so land in the spirit stream and then from there we're going to head over to the ray lucaria crystal tunnel so on your map it'll be this big orange spot that's where we're going you're definitely going to want to put a marker there because it's kind of hard to see it's really well hidden behind all these trees and shit like even with the marker i couldn't find it for a second there but anyway, so you're going to want a strike weapon for this. Um, I'm not going to give a full walkthrough for this entire tunnel because it's a little lengthy. But you're definitely going to want a strike weapon for this part, like the Morningstar that we grabbed. All the enemies in this cave are really weak to strike damage. And as you can see, they're also weak to fire. So if you have fire pots or fire spells, that's also really helpful against them. But make sure you loot all of the smithing stones that are in this cave. I think there's like eight smithing stone threes. And there's also a bunch of 1s and 2s, so make sure you grab those all, because you need 12 threes to upgrade your weapon to plus 9. So the boss of this tunnel is just a single Crystallion, so you can get backstabs on them like that, but it's a lot easier if you just stance break them. So I'm going to hit her with some charged R2s. Using the Morningstar, it should only take two charged R2s. Real quick, I want to demonstrate. So when I hit it with Fan Daggers, it doesn't do anything. She's completely unfazed. She's not even taking damage. But once I get the stance break on her, it, you see it like cracks her. Her texture has changed and she's all like cracked and fucked up now. Now any damage that you do to her is going to stun her. You see the fan daggers are stunning her and they're doing a regular amount of damage. Even if she's doing an attack animation, the fan daggers will stun her out of it now. And in fact, she's so weak, I'll show you in a second. Obviously the hammer is going to also stun her. I'll show you in a second here. If you're wearing something like the briar armor, which does... Uh, makes your rolls do damage. So wearing one piece, your rolls do like two damage per hit. Even the Briar Armor will stun her. So make sure you get the stance break. Her stance health doesn't regenerate, unlike other enemies. So if you need to take your time to dodge away from her attacks or whatever, you don't have to keep up the pressure to prevent her stance health from regenerating. She only has 70 poise, and then once you do 70 poise damage, it'll break her, and it never regenerates. So anyway... After your stance breaker, just fucking wail on her. And then once she's dead, she drops the Smithing Stone Miner's Bell Bearing 1. So now we can buy infinite Smithing Stone 1s and 2s from the Twin Maiden Husks in the Round Table Hold. So in case you don't know about Bell Bearings, you can go over to the Twin Maiden Husks and hit Offer a Bell Bearing. I can't turn it in because I'm on New Game Plus and I've already handed it in. But you'll have the option to give it to her. And then you'll see she has smithing stone 1s and 2s in the inventory now. Now you can easily upgrade any weapon you want up to plus 6. And then using the smithing stone 3s that we picked up from the crystal tunnel and in Lyernia, uh, you can bring a weapon up to plus 9. While we're here in the round table hold, I'm going to talk to Brother Corin and buy the magic fortification spell from him. It only requires 10 faith to cast and it gives you, I think, 30% magic resistance for, I want to say, 60 seconds. And again, in case you're not aware, if you go to the Twin Maiden Husks and you go over to the Armament section, you can buy a Finger Seal from her. This allows you to cast spells. So I'll show in a second the spell memorization and casting process, but that lets you cast uh, incantations, I should say, not sorceries. Anyway, so go to a Site of Grace, hit Memorize Spells, and then find the spell you want to memorize. In this case, we're going to grab Magic Fortification. Then while you have a seal equipped in your hand... So in this case, it's in my left hand. I'm going to hit L1. If it was in your right hand, it would be R1 or whatever your attack button is. And that'll cast the selected spell. So in this case, it gave me Magic Fortification. Magic Fortification does stack with the Spell Drake Talisman. So you see, I right now I have like 50% Magic Resistance. You can see here on the right, I have 50% Magic Negation. Don't worry about defense right now. But the negation is important. If I take off all my armor, yeah, I'm at a base, what is that, 35%. So... It's really good to have, and that does stack with your armor and the talisman, so that'll give us, I think with the armor that I put on, it gives me like 60% total. Yeah, something like that, so Ranala's not going to do much damage to us. Speaking of armor, there's a pretty good set of armor we can get in Ray Lucaria itself. So from the schoolhouse classroom, right before you fight the Red Wolf of Radagon, head back to the giant water wheel, elevator, whatever the hell this thing is supposed to be, and you can actually ride it down if you run over to the other side. It takes you down into this pit, and there's some loot and stuff down here, but we're not too worried about that, so I'm going to jump off here. And then I checked out this area. Um, there's just like a soldier ashes, whatever. Um, there's a bunch of stuff to explore here, obviously, so check it out. But you can take it back up. And now we're back on the bridge where we first got on the elevator after the graveyard. 
with all the dogs and all the putrid corpses. So through this window, you can jump down onto this little cliff here and then follow the path around. It takes us to this gravestone. In front of the gravestone is a carrion knight set. Real quick, I'm going to say you should kill those putrid corpses before you grab the armor. Um, they only attack you one by one if you attack them individually. When you grab the armor, they all attack you at once. But anyway, so this set gives pretty good magic negation. Between this, the spell, and the talisman, we have about 60% magic negation, so Renala's not going to do much damage to us. Now I'm going to grab the crystal tears that I'm going to use for this fight. So first, I headed over to the Erd Tree in the Mistwood. Right over here on the road, there's a site of grace called the Mistwood Outskirts. I didn't grab it here, but you should. It's pretty easy to find. It's just off the road. Uh, if you were at Fort Height before, you can just go straight ahead to the Erd Tree. Obviously, it's a gigantic, glowing, golden tree, so it shouldn't be hard to find. And then at the base of it, there's a basin that will have two crystal tiers in it. I believe it's the Spiked Cracked tier, which increases your charge attack damage, and the Green Spill Crystal tier, which increases your max stamina. After that, I headed over to the Erd Tree in the Weeping Peninsula. You can get here from the Bridge of Sacrifice, just follow the road south, make a right, then follow it across the Wooden Bridge. That'll take you up this road over here, and then at the very top of this, you'll see there's a path that leads up to the tree. You can use the Church of Pilgrimage as like a waypoint for how to get to that path, but it's just directly to the south of the church. Speaking of which, there's three churches on the Weeping Peninsula that each have a sacred tier uh, to upgrade your flasks with, and there's also a golden seed in that spot I was just showing, so make sure you grab those if you haven't already grabbed them. So in order to get the Crystal Tears from this tree, we need to kill this Erdtree Avatar. It's really weak to strike damage and fire damage. Before we start the fight, I'm going to drink my Physic with whatever tears you have, and then we're going to cast Golden Vow for the buff. And you'll see I'm using the Morning Star because it does strike damage. And if you have Fire Pots, they do a lot of fire damage. This thing has a 100% weakness to fire, so it takes twice as much fire damage from any attack that you cast at it. So Fire Pots, Fire Grease, Fire Spells, all are really effective against this thing. These things are really simple, and since this one's pretty weak, it shouldn't hit you too hard. When you see it hit me, I take a lot of damage, but that's because I'm in New Game Plus, so that's why. If it's giving you a hard time, you can actually just get on Torrent and run in circles around it and throw fire pots at it. You just have to be careful of that attack, the Golden Land, um, but that's really easy to dodge. You just sprint to the side, and the bullets will land behind you instead of actually hitting you. Upon killing it, it drops two tiers, so there's the Opaline Bubble tier. It sucks, don't use the Opaline Bubble tier. And then it also drops the Crimson Burst Crystal tier, which gives us health regen, um, so that's really helpful to have. So in my Physic, I went with Crystal Burst, and I used the Green Spill Crystal tier. You can use whichever ones you want, but I definitely recommend at least the Crimson Burst. I don't think I would recommend the Spike Crack tier. It does increase your charge attack damage, but I want to say like 10 or 15%, something like that, which is a lot, especially if you stack it with the Axe Talisman. But Renala has a tendency to jump away a lot, so you might not really get a chance to hit her with a Charge R2, unless you have, uh, you know, like a fast weapon, like a fist or a dagger or something. And then there's also the Not tiers, um, if you need any stat requirements for any of the stuff that we picked up. But the main one that I think is important here is the Crimson Burst tier, because that health regen is really good when she starts hitting you with her spells and stuff, or when she's got a, a summon attacking you. So our last bit of setup is going to be the shortcut that we're going to set up. I think the intended shortcut that you're supposed to take is the one on the left, where we head up this little pile of rubble, and then you go past a bunch of sorcerers, and you go across this bridge over here, this covered bridge. Um, behind that middle pillar there, by the way, there's a golden seed, so make sure you grab that. But I think that shortcut kind of sucks because there's a bunch of sorcerers guarding it and in the process of running past them, it's either going to be time consuming to fight them or you're going to lose flasks and stuff in the process of fighting them. So I like to come up here and disable this ball. Obviously this path on its own kind of sucks because, you know, the giant balls get in your way. But it turns out we actually can stop the balls from spawning permanently. Before that, we're going to want to deal with Moongrum. So he's kind of famous because he has a tendency to parry you. If he has his shield out in his left hand, he can parry you. He also has a staff that he can pull out, and when he has his staff out, he can't parry you. But I like to grab the flail, um, which can't be parried, and that way you don't have to worry about getting parried. You can just wail on him. Um, alternatively, since I got bored of like trying to fight him, uh, you can just get him to jump off the elevator. So in this case, he ended up going up it, and then he despawned when he was up there and respawned down here. So I send the elevator up, and then I just throw a throwing knife at him. And then if you run to the other side of the gap, his pathfinding doesn't take him around the hole. And so 
he just jumps into it and fucking dies like an idiot. Anyway, like I said before, the intended shortcut is to come this way. So first we're going to kill the sorcerer. That one can do a shotgun blast type of thing, so be careful of that because it does a lot of damage. But this is supposed to be the intended shortcut from the debate parlor. You come out and head to the left and then come up to this bridge. But you see, there's a whole bunch of sorcerers guarding it. There's a bunch of wandering nobles with swords. So it's really just not a great way to go because you're going to end up losing health and flasks in the process, most likely, because they're going to be attacking you with their spells. So instead, we're going to get rid of the giant balls that spawn. So if you come over here back to where that first sorcerer was, there's a little hidden ledge that you can jump down to here and you end up in this room. Make sure you open this door first in case you die. There's a couple enemies we need to kill that were up that ladder we just saw. So open this door so you don't have to run all the way around it each time. Obviously, that's where we just came from right before getting to Moongrum. Anyway, so go up the ladder. At the top, there's two sorcerers and a pumpkin head over there. So we need to kill those two sorcerers. And then there's this one. So I'm just going to hit him with a charge R2. Charge R2. And another R1. If you kill him quick enough, it won't aggro the other ones. So you see there's these two sorcerers. There's one behind the pillar there. Uh, and then they're summoning balls through the portal. So you don't need to kill the pumpkin head. If it's giving you a hard time, you just need to worry about the sorcerers. So I kill the sorcerers. You'll see up here, there's this chest that has, uh, I don't know what's in that chest. It's probably something good. And then if you jump down onto this little roof over here, there's the, uh, I think that's the sorcery scarab or the ash of war scarab. It's a helmet that you can wear. But anyway, so now that we've killed those two sorcerers, we can come out onto the stairs and the ball doesn't spawn. And so now the ball will never spawn. Even if you die, the sorcerers will respawn, but the ball permanently is disabled. It never spawns. And so once you've dealt with that and with Moongrum, you can just come up these stairs every time and you have a better shortcut that doesn't require going past any enemies. Now we're going to go over our stats, loadout, and strategy. So first of all, if we look at Renala's stats, we'll see that she has 80 poise, which means it'll be pretty easy to hit her with a stance break. She exclusively deals magic damage, though she does have summons that will do other kinds of damage like physical and fire, but the main one you're going to be dealing with is magic. She's very weak to physical damage with a negative 10% absorption for standard, slash, and pierce. Her strike damage resistance is zero, but it's still good enough if you want to use a strike weapon. She has 80% magic resistance, so you definitely don't want to use magic damage against her because that's just going to be a real slog. She has 40% base resistance to fire, lightning, and holy damage. However, because the entire floor of her arena is covered in water, she actually gets a 10% extra resistance to fire and a 10% weakness to lightning. So definitely don't use fire against her, and if you really want to use spells or elemental damage, lightning is the way to go. And finally, the only status effect that she's particularly weak to is bleed, so if you're going to use a status effect, that's the one to go with. However, you'll do just fine using poison, rot, and frostbite too. I'm going to do two different runs of this boss fight. For one of them, I'll use the Lance Great Spear with Impaling Thrust, and for the other one, I'll use Power Stanced Broadswords, one of which will have Stormblade on it. I'll also be using a Morning Star with the Wild Strikes Ash of War on it, and I'll be putting Blood Grease on that, which you can't see on this screen, but I will be using Blood Grease. My other weapons include a Dagger, which has the Golden Vow Ash of War on it. You can put Golden Vow on any weapon, I just like using the Dagger because it's light and it's easy to get a bunch of them. And finally, I'm using the Finger Seal so that I can cast the Magic Fortification Incantation. After that, for our Talismans, I use the Green Turtle Talisman to increase my Stamina Regen, and the Spelldrake Talisman. Here it shows the Spelldrake Talisman plus 2, but I'm actually using the Spelldrake Talisman plus 1, which we got in Celia, Town of Sorcery. The Spelldrake Talisman increases our Magic Resistance, which is obviously going to be really good against Ranala, who does exclusively magic damage. For my armor, I'm using the Carrion Knight set. It's easy to get, it's right before Ranala, and it gives good magic resistance, so it's just an all-around good set to have. The only spell I have equipped is Magic Fortification. It gives, I think, 30 or 35% uh, resistance to magic damage, so that's really good to have for this. And then in my Wondrous Physic, I have the Crimson Burst Crystal Tier, which gives us health regen for 3 minutes, which is really good to have. And I have the Green Spill Crystal Tier, which increases our maximum stamina. You can use any tiers you want, but I recommend at least the Crimson Burst one. On the left side, you'll see my attributes. So the character that I'm on is at level 60 with plus 9 weapons. You'll see I started as a wretch, so all of my base stats are at 10. 
The first one that matters here is Vigor. It is by far the most important stat in the game. For any character, any build that you're making, make sure you have at least 40 Vigor. You always want to have at least 40 Vigor. That's just a good number to have. It's a lot of health. It's the first Vigor soft cap. 40 Vigor. After that, I went with 19 Endurance. That just gives me enough equip load to be able to carry one of the two weapons that we're using, along with the dagger, the seal, the armor, and the talismans. And then I have 20 Strength and 20 Dexterity, just to be able to meet the requirements for whatever weapon I wanted to use. And finally, I have 10 Faith so that I can cast Magic Fortification. Also, something not shown here is I'm using Throwing Daggers, which you can get from Kale in the Church of Ella in Limgrave. Those are going to be really useful for Phase 1. So before entering the arena, the only thing that I'm going to do is put Blood Grease on the Morning Star. We're going to drink the Wondrous Physic and cast Golden Vow and Magic Fortification later on. In Phase 1, Renala is floating in the air protected by a shield, and you have to beat up these children to break the ones that are casting the shield and break her shield. So you have to hit three of the kids, you don't want to kill them. If you kill them, then they respawn, and they can end up in a spot like this back here where you have to go looking for them. So don't kill them, just hit them once. That's why I like using throwing daggers, because you can just throw them at a distance, you can lock onto it and throw the dagger at a distance and hit the kid, and one hit is all it takes to break that kid's shield, and then you just have to do that three times. After that, I make sure I have Blood Grease on the Morning Star, and I go up to Renala and use Wild Strikes to wail on her with the Blood Grease. I have the Morning Star at plus 9. If you had it at plus 10, 11, 12, it would probably kill her in one cycle, but since I didn't, uh, it takes two cycles. After her second cycle, she can start taking the kids and turning them into like tombstones, and then she'll shoot them at you. Um, those are pretty dangerous. They're relatively easy to dodge, but you don't even have to worry about it if you're quick enough and you just break her shield before she even has an opportunity to attack you. So keep an eye on her health. Once she dies, it's going to transition to phase 2. Immediately upon killing her, drink your Wondrous Physic, because it immediately goes to phase 2 and you don't have much time. At the start of phase 2, before you cast any buffs, I'm going to switch over to the Lance while I run up to her. And then, if you get close to her, Comet Azure won't hit you. So that's an opportunity to cast Magic Fortification and Golden Vow. You saw how she did her full moon attack. She seems to do that pretty consistently if you run up to her and just stand next to her while she's casting Comet Azure. So while she's charging that up, that would be a good time to cast Golden Vow and any other buffs you want to use. There you saw she did her Crystal Shotgun attack. Uh, if you're close enough to her, you can just dodge in front of her or even do an Impaling Thrust and attack her, and that'll make it miss you because it'll be behind you when it shoots. We're using a Lance with Impaling Thrust, so the Lance gets great range and Impaling Thrust does a ton of poise damage, so it makes it really easy to get stance breaks on her. Here she does her Star Shower attack. The way I deal with this is I'll sprint for a little bit and then I'll dodge past it. In this case, because of my positioning, I was able to just sprint and they all hit the ground behind me. But once you run past them a little bit, if you do a dodge, it uh, dodges them more consistently. So here you see she's going to summon her lone wolves. You see, after I attack her with an impaling thrust or any attack, I don't just keep mashing the attack button. I give her a second to see what she's going to do so I can react to it. So if you were attacking her there, then you would get knocked down by the summon, seal, spell, whatever you want to call it. The summoning thing will knock you down. It doesn't do damage, but it's just annoying as shit. The best way to deal with any of her summons is just run away from them. They're not worth the time and effort it takes to kill them unless you have someone that does a big area of effect. Especially the Bloodhound Knight. Don't even bother fighting this thing. Once this thing is on the field, just sprint away from it. Keep an eye on Ranala so you can dodge her attacks. But other than that, just run away from the Bloodhound Knight. Here, again, she did her Star Shower, and then she did a Comet Azure. So I managed to get the Star Shower to hit the ground behind me, but it would have been a lot safer to dodge, too. So just keep that in mind. And then Comet Azure, you can either sprint to the side if you're too far away from her, or you see how she's so tall. If you get up close to her and you stand, like, directly in front of her, then the Comet Azure will be above you and it won't hit you. There you saw I got hit by her staff when she threw it because I was just mashing the attack button. So just be prepared to dodge in between attacks. Don't mash the attack button. And here I get knocked down by the summon. Again, it's because I was mashing the attack button. If I had been more patient, that wouldn't have happened. This time she chose to summon the dragon. It'll always open up by doing its fire breath attack from left to right. So what you do is once it's facing towards you, you can just dodge forward underneath the fire. I had her at really low health here, and I knew I was going to kill her in one or two hits, so I didn't worry about the dragon, I just kept attacking her. But 
like I said, it's usually best to just run away from the summons and try not to die while you wait for them to despawn. At the end of the fight there, you probably noticed I quit out so I could do it again. This time we're going to use the Broadsword. So I had one with Spinning Slash and one with Stormblade. I ended up not using Spinning Slash, but Stormblade can be really helpful, so I recommend trying that. And since the Broadswords are lighter, I was also able to carry the Morning Star and the Broadswords at the same time. So I didn't have to go into my inventory and hard swap from the Morning Star to the Swords when I started Phase 2. So we're going to be using Power Stance Straight Swords, you might also call it Dual Wielding. So first of all, you see here on one of the broadswords, I have Stormblade. It's just a really good attack to have at range, especially since Renala likes to jump away from you a lot. But so if you don't know about power stancing, if you're holding two weapons of the same type, so for example, any two straight swords, any two hammers, any two great hammers, right? Any weapons of the same class. It doesn't have to be a broadsword and a broadsword. It could be a broadsword and a longsword or a broadsword and a lordsword and straight sword, right? And that applies to other weapon types too. You can do it with colossal weapons if you wanted. If you're carrying a weapon of the same type in each hand, then hitting R1 will let you attack with your right hand, and hitting R2 will do heavy attacks with your right hand weapon. But if you hit L1, it attacks with both weapons at once. And hitting L2 will use your Ash of War. You can't do a heavy attack with uh, power stance weapons. I chose to power stance straight swords because they're really fast and they hit really hard. So for phase one, we're going to do the same thing as before. We're not going to cast any buffs and we're going to use the Morning Star with Blood Grease on it to deal with the Juvenile Scholars, find the one with the yellow glow around it and then hit it with a throwing knife. You don't want to kill them. If you kill them, then they can respawn in the back area and you have to run around looking for them. You see here a chandelier falls. So you can see fire dripping from the ceiling and then if you're underneath it, the chandelier will fall. So be really careful when you're running in between the bookshelves. Keep an eye out for any chandeliers that might fall because those things do a ton of damage. So once I've hit the third glowing scholar, I put blood grease on the morning star and I just go up to Renala and just fucking wail on her using wild strikes. Here, I'm gonna get hit by her shield when she goes back to her fucking shielded state uh, like this. While editing this, I counted the number of swings that I did there. I think I did 16 swings with the Wild Strikes before she summoned her sealed back and hit me. So you probably want to do like 10 to 12 swings with the Wild Strikes. And after you do about 12 hits, you want to cancel Wild Strikes and dodge away so you don't get hit by the shield. Uh, it's just a safer strat. The shield doesn't do a huge amount of damage, but you know, it's safer like that. So as soon as she dies in phase one, I immediately drink my Physic. And then we head to phase two. I sprint towards her so that I'm underneath her common azure and it won't hit me. And before attacking her, I cast magic fortification. And like I said before, it seems pretty consistent that if you stand next to her without attacking her, she'll do the full moon spell. So she's invulnerable during that and it has a pretty long charge up time. So that would have been a good opportunity to cast not only magic fortification, but also golden vow if I had it equipped. But I didn't have golden vow uh, on my dagger in my inventory right now. Here I hit her with Spinning Slash a few times. Spinning Slash does a lot of damage and it does a lot of poise damage too. Um, so that's why I got that stance break there. Uh, when I wake her up from the repost, I hit her with a Charge R2 because that does even more poise damage. But honestly, I don't really recommend using uh, Spinning Slash during this fight. I, I suggest you just stick to the uh, L1s and Stormblade. There I tried to heal in front of her and she summoned the Giant. So when she summons a Giant, she teleports away, which is annoying as hell and the giant will immediately spawn in like jumping down at you so make sure you roll back from it so it doesn't hit you. The giant is pretty easy to avoid so uh, I don't really mind attacking her while the giant is on the field but for her other summons I suggest you run away so they don't attack you. Here I saw she was doing her summon and because the power stand straight swords is so fast I was able to recover fast enough to be able to dodge away from the summon so I didn't get knocked down by it. This time she summoned a dragon. I was able to get a couple hits on her before she dodged away. And then again, once the dragon's fire comes at you, just dodge through it. So unlike the last run, her health is too high. I know I'm not going to be able to finish her off before the dragon attacks. So I run away from it. Here I want you to watch the dragon. So it jumps up into the air and does one as it goes up into the air. Then it flaps once. So that's a second. Then it flaps again. That's a third. And then after the third one starts moving towards you, once its feet are both aiming towards you, that's when you want to dodge. If you watch that again, you'll see its feet are like coming towards me. That's when I hit a dodge button. So again, it jumps up in the air. It does two flaps while it's in the air. 
So that's the second flap. And then right here, you see both of its feet are facing towards me. That's when I dodge. I like to dodge backwards towards where its head is gonna land. Um, it's not always super duper consistent, I don't think, but it works pretty much all the time. So that's the way I like to dodge those attacks. And then after that, I just keep up the pressure on Renala. I use Spinning Slash again. Again, I'm going to say I suggest using Stormblade. Um, it'll be more consistent damage if she's dodging away from you a lot. But, you know, if you're good at staying within range of her, then Spinning Slash will do pretty well. But that concludes my guide for how to beat Renala easily. If you found that helpful, please leave a like and consider subscribing. If you have any questions or suggestions, comment them down below. And I'll catch you later.